Good evening. I'm so excited to have everyone join us tonight. My name is Sadia Khan. I'm the Director of Integrative Breast Oncology at Hogue Hospital. So I help run the survivorship program and we're, we have a wonderful program for you tonight for our empowerment series. So in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we are going to be talking about mindful resilience, cultivating balance and calm through active mindfulness, and also talking about revitalizing your skin and tailoring your skin care regimen for your needs. So we've got some great talks coming up. And just a reminder, because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, please, please, please go out and get your mammogram if you haven't had your yearly mammogram. And for some women, and this could be true for your friends and family members, some patients do qualify for um, mammograms earlier than age 40. So please talk to your doctor and just remember that early detection saves lives and mammograms do save lives. Okay, so we hope you guys enjoy the event tonight. It is um, going to be featured and recorded. So if you miss part of the event, you can always go back and watch the video on the Hogue YouTube channel and any of our previous events. So please um, keep that in mind. And then we would love to hear back from you. For those of you who are joining us, um, please, and, uh, if you have any questions, enter them into the chat box so that we can address them towards the end of the event. And um, yeah, so without further ado, I'll introduce our two wonderful speakers. Today, um, our first talk will be from Carrie York. Carrie is an oncology trained esthetician and as well as herself being a breast cancer survivor. She is uh, excited to participate today in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month and also in honor of her mother who passed away from breast cancer. We're really sorry to hear that, Carrie. She has been with Hogue for 10 years and manages Hogue's Brighter Image Program. The Brighter Image Program has been serving the community for over 30 years, providing wigs, and scarves to Hogue breast cancer patients. So we're really excited to hear from you, Carrie. Our second speaker is Anusha Wajaya Kumar. She is a wellness consultant for Hogue Hospital, where she actively engages and champions mindfulness and meditation practices for maternal mental health program, as well as our breast cancer survivors and our early uh, breast and ovarian cancer prevention program, as well as the early risk assessment program. Um, so Anusha is very in tune with all of our breast cancer patients and all of our previvors. She's one of the first people to create a program to be used in clinical research at Hope Hospital. And she's recently been published on meditation with attention, quick and easy ways to create lasting peace. So we're really excited to get started. Before Carrie gets started, I will have Anusha just set the tone for the evening tonight and give us a quick one minute or two minute little meditation so that we can kind of set the tone and have a wonderful event. So I'll let you take it away, Anusha. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. And I am thrilled and delighted to be here with you all today. We will have time for a longer practice at the end of my presentation, but I just wanted to offer everybody one of my favorite mindfulness practices to begin. So wherever you are, just come to a comfortable seated position. You can have the palms gently resting down on tops of the thighs. You don't have to close the eyes for this practice, but you can certainly do so if that feels comfortable to you. And let's just take a moment here to arrive into the physical body, into this moment, this gift that we have given ourselves of the next hour of being together in virtual community, for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Now I'll just take you through a very quick relaxation practice. So I want you to take your attention to the crown of the head and gently start to relax the muscles, moving down through the forehead, the ears, the cheeks, the jaw, the chin, moving down through the neck, the shoulders, often places where we store a lot of tightness and tension. So just take your breath to any places where you're feeling a sense of tightness or tension and breathe into those spaces. 
Moving down now through the arms, the hands, the torso, the chest, the abdomen, the pelvic area, the hips, the thighs, the knees, the calves, the shins, right down to the tips of the toes. And just feel if you're sensing any areas of tightness or tension, that you're utilizing your breath as your tool to alleviate this tightness, this tension. Now perhaps go back to any other areas that you noted, breathing into those spaces. And gently start to feel the weight of your body wherever you were situated before gently opening your eyes if they were closed. That's one of my favorite mindfulness practices, which can be done anywhere. You could do it at the checkout queue at the grocery store. You can do it in your car. You can do it at your desk. You, as I mentioned, don't have to close your eyes. It's just a really good way of drawing your attention together, uh, really bringing the body and mind together as one through your breath. So back to you, Dr. Khan. Thank you so much. Now that we're all relaxed, let's wake up a little bit. <laughs> um, and we're really excited to hear your talk, Carrie. Tell us a little bit about skin and how we can improve our skin regimen, um, especially after all the different treatments that you can get with breast cancer. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you again. The first um, Hogue Healing Survivorship event I did was in 2018. This is one of my favorite events. And skin is one of my favorite things to talk about. So the good thing about skin is there's no good, bad, right, or wrong, or normal. It's your own individual um, vessel that you live in. And um, I wanna make sure that you have the tips and tricks and the tools that you need to feel as comfortable as you can in the skin that you're in. Today, I wanna to note, it's not medical and product neutral. So I'm not here to promote any sort of specific brand. And when I say non-medical, this is in particular for those of you who are in active radiation treatment, specifically in the areas that are being treated where the radiation is um, localized, you need to revert back to everything that your team and nurses and oncologists state that you need to be doing for that skin during radiation. So now that I have that caveat out of the way, we're gonna look at some tips and tricks to revitalize and rejuvenate your skin. And we're gonna look at it in three different areas. So first of all, we have to decide where you are in treatment. That's the most important thing. Um, so we'll look at the different areas of treatment and how they're defined. We'll do a quick skin check-in and how we're gonna do that is we're gonna analyze our skin type versus our skin condition and which one of those we're having problems with. From there, we're gonna to touch a little bit on the acid mantle and you may be thinking to yourself, what is the acid mantle and do I have one? Yes, you do. And again, everyone's is different. So we're gonna talk about the acid mantle. Um, and those three things are gonna help you to figure out where you're at with your skin and how to treat it. So one thing to note during um, a skincare, um, a cancer diagnosis and subsequent treatment is that your skin is going to change. So you notice it, even when you're going to get those um, diagnostic tests. So if you're getting a CAT scan, an MRI, all the x-rays, the surgeries, they temporarily dry your skin. And you may notice it, or um, it might be something you don't notice, but it's a temporary thing. So are the, all the other changes that happen when you're going through treatment. So some of the changes that you may be noticing is changes in your skin tone. So it may be um, a little bit, um, not as translucent, a little tallow. Um, you're gonna notice that some of your vascularity or your redness may be flushing up a little bit more. You might notice um, 
some visual distortions, meaning that um, you may be retaining fluid, especially in this area. If you are um, on steroids, then you might have a noticeable kind of roundness happen to your features. And then some treatments will make you either gain weight or lose weight. So these are visual changes um, that you see, but aren't necessarily changes to your skin. The physical changes that happen to your skin, a lot of people complain of dehydration and dryness, which shows up as flakiness, sometimes peeling, and also a lot of people express that they have more skin sensitivity. So we'll look at that a little bit more, but first we need to figure out who's wearing treatment. We have over 95 people in the class last time I checked. So that means everyone's at a different variation of treatment. So let's get some terms that will help everyone figure out where they're at. First of all, the word survivor. The word survivor is a word that's given to us as a term of empowerment from the day that we're diagnosed. So everybody in this class today is a survivor, but you're all at different levels of treatment. So we know we're all survivors, but let's move on to the next step. Are you in active treatment? So active treatment is from the time that you start receiving treatment for your cancer all the way to the end. So let's say you started at the beginning January, 2021, and that you're done with that treatment, let's say January, 2022. So that means you had treatment for one year. Um, that leads us to recovery. So recovery time is as long as you're in treatment. So I'm gonna review these really quickly and get them out of the way. Recovery time, as long as you are in treatment. So if you were in treatment for that one year, your recovery time is equal to that treatment one year after you finish treatment. For many people in this room, that's gonna be as long as five years, 10 years, or maybe even longer um, that you're in that recovery period because you're on those hormone therapies that are going to um, slow down the hormone process in your body. So five to 10 years, you might be still on treatment and then you have recovery time for five to 10 years. It's gonna affect your skin for that block of time. The other thing I wanted to talk about is after you move out of recovery, you're into long-term survivorship or you're managing metastatic disease. And when you're doing that in skincare, our focus is on um, quality of life and quality of skin. So we're able to determine maybe a little bit more aggressive means of skincare based on where our skin is at, which is the next thing that we're gonna be looking at. So where is your skin with sensitivity? These are the things I want you to ask yourself when you're applying the products that you have on at home, your regular products, are you feeling a little bit of that, what we call flashing, where your skin gets really, really hot and you think, whoo, hot, and then it subsides immediately. This is the beginning of an inflammatory response. It's the beginning of prolonged sensitivity. And this is the key to stop using whatever product it is that's making you do that. So for some very savvy users, that could be prescription retinols. Um, it could be serums that have vitamin A's, vitamin C's, all the antioxidants, all these powerful anti-aging ingredients. You're gonna need to set those aside. Um, let's also talk about genetic predisposition. So we, we figure out where we are in treatment, but we also have to figure out what we were born with. So our skin type is what we're born with. And a skin type is based basically on oil production. So there is oil dry skin, meaning they're not producing a lot of oils. There is a combination skin, which is a combination of oily skin and oil dry skin. And then there is oily skin, which also can tend to be acneic as you're going through life. So those are things that are intrinsic factors. They're what you're born with. You can blame your parents if you'd like. This is what you come to earth with. And for the most part, for most part, excuse me, these things don't change. So you always have that skin type. There are very few times in your life that things can change. So if you've had an oily acne skin and you went on a prescription um, different or any of those really strong A vitamin A derivative products, your skin type may have changed. It was medically induced into that change, but it has changed. Skin care or skin cancer treatment can also change your skin. So you'll go from uh, oily skin to a combination skin. 
may not be that noticeable. You might be thinking, oh, I don't have to manage oil. I don't have to use my little sheets to mop up some of the oil production that I get. A combination skin might become a little drier, a little bit more sensitive, and that dry skin, which may not have ever been sensitive before, just drier, um, can become more sensitive. So how do you figure this out at home? Next time you're in the mirror, what I want you to do is just take your finger and lift right at the side of your face right here. And what you'll see, you might need a mag lamp, you might need some really bright light, but what you'll see is a mesh-like appearance. It looks like um, when you've peeled the dry skin off the onion and there's that first layer that has that kind of translucent crisscross hatching, you'll see that, but as soon as you take your finger away, it will dissipate. And the amount of dehydration you have is going to be noticeable. So if you have just surface dehydration, a little bit of dehydration, you might just see faint marks of it. But if it travels all the way up your face, cheek, jawline, then you know that you're experiencing a severe amount of dehydration. One thing to note about dehydration, it's a lack of water, and it is typically on areas that are exposed. So they will see it on our face, our decollete, sometimes our arms, hands, and feet if we don't wear shoes that are covering our feet. So dehydration is typically on the very exposed areas. Most everybody has surface dehydration on their skin. So you can pretty much tick off, I have surface dehydration, I should always treat for it when I'm um, giving myself a home skincare treatment, whether it's a serum or a mask especially when you're going through active treatment, recent recovery, and actually all the categories, long-term survivorship, managing metastatic disease, always treat for dehydration. Um, the next thing is dryness. So dryness is the skin type. Dehydration is a skin condition. So let me back up for just a minute. A skin condition is something that is extrinsic. It's something that we have done. Uh, I don't like to say we've done to ourselves because that just puts too much blame, but it's part of being in our environment. So just being in the room that I'm in right now, it has circulated air. Um, my surface skin is going to get dehydrated, but it also has to do with lifestyle. So if you're having that rock star lifestyle, you might notice a little more dehydration on your skin. And um, also you may notice a little more premature aging. I say premature aging because we're all aging. Um, but you may notice that you're having some effects of life that show up on your skin as um, changes that uh, happen just because of lifestyle. So these are all things that are conditions. The skin type dry is the genetic predisposition. So going back to analyzing your skin at home, when you lift with your finger at the side of your jowls and cheek line, you'll notice a uh, prune-like appearance. I'm not going to say wrinkly, just that kind of that undulating type of appearance on the skin. And it is going to dissipate um, a little slower or a little more slowly than when you took your finger down when you're looking for um, dehydration. So you'll see that pitting the, the little valleys lasting a little bit longer. And if you're noticing that on your skin, then you do have a more dry skin type so we've looked at where we are in treatment, which is very important when you're trying to figure out um, what skincare to use at home. We've looked at your skin type and your skin condition. So where you are genetically predisposed and also um, where you are from being in the environment. The third factor, which is also very, very important is what we call in my world, the acid mantle. And whenever I say acid mantle, the people that are not in the skincare world, they think, what is an acid mantle and do I have one? Yes, you do. So your acid mantle is the invisible protective force field that we have that lives on the surface of our skin. It is a combination of sweat and sebum, and it leans a little bit more acidic. So the skin, the largest organ of the body, has an acidic state of being, which lands somewhere in the pH scale of a 4.5 to a 5.5 which means it keeps bacteria out. It also keeps um, water from penetrating in. It also keeps water and moisture from oozing out. So if you are not creating the same amount of sweat, which comes from the sudoriferous gland or sebum, which comes from the sebaceous gland, the lipid piece, 
hydrolipid, also what the acid mantle is called, hydrolipidic film. If you are not creating as much sweat and sebum, then you won't have as much of a protective mechanism on your skin. And what that means is for those of you who normally not have sensitive or reactive skins, your skin may become more sensitive or reactive. Typically those are localized hot spots and you need to always address for skin sensitivity first. So if you had a fairly normal skin and you just were suffering from dehydration and a little bit of dryness, and then all of a sudden you're starting to have skin sensitivity, all of your focus is going to be on how to calm that sensitivity and also replenishing that natural barrier that we have. So finding products that add hydration and also add oils to your skin. So you may use normally on your body, just a regular lotion, but if you're noticing you're having these hot spots all over your body, um, you're going to probably want to increase to something that's thicker in weight, a cream, which is going to mimic that natural acid mantle and keep your protective moisture in your skin. A lot of information, but it's all to say that first to deal with your skin sensitivity. The second thing that you're going to want to deal with is the dehydration. The next thing you'll want to deal with is the lack of oil in your skin. So I liken this to when you're getting dressed to go outside. If you want something that's lightweight, um, you're going to put a t-shirt on. So you're focusing on your hydration. Your products tend to be a little bit lighter in weight. So your hydration products are like putting your t-shirt on. Your products that have some oil, we want them to seal in that moisture so they're thicker products in nature. It's like putting a sweater on over your t-shirt. And then the next piece of that equation is, especially yesterday, you're not gonna go out without a rain jacket. Um, for all those that are, are local, we had quite a storm yesterday. Your last level of protection is gonna be sunscreen, which is your protective raincoat. And we need to make sure, especially during uh, treatment and subsequent recovery, and also managing long-term survivorship and met metastatic, or all of us, let's just say all of us need to be applying sunscreen all of the time. Um, we just don't get the natural protection and we're usually sitting in windows and things like that. I say at least an SPF 15. I like to stay in the window of an SPF 15 to an SPF 30. Reason being is the higher you get up and the sun protecting factors, the 45s, the 50s, the 70s on up, you're using more chemicals in that product to protect you from the sunshine um, I really think the best products are the titanium dioxides and the zinc oxides. They're physical means of blocking. So they used to be, um, for those of you that are close to my age, they used to be very, very white when you applied them to the skin. They are now micronized, so they're very small um, molecular size. So even though when you apply them to the skin, they do look a little white, but they dissipate really quickly. They are a physical means of block, meaning the sun comes hits that and is repelled off versus those stronger, higher SPF, those ingredients absorb the sun into the skin and then break it down and release it as heat. So you can see that could be problematic for somebody who has a sensitive skin. You don't wanna add a heat process to somebody that's having hot spots or what I call wasabi skin. Um, so it's best to stick with something that's more titanium or zinc based. And if you're wondering what that means when you go to, or wondering where that puts you when you go shopping to get sunscreen, I like to say, um, if you want to keep something for sensitive skin, try the stuff that's um, formulated for babies, because it's really going to be the gentlest and the most efficacious when it comes to sunscreen and an SPF 15 and 30. If you're out for longer than a couple hours, you're going to need to reapply that or sunscreen. Um, that's another reason why you don't need to go so high because you really do need to reapply it every couple of hours. Um, if you're in a work environment where you're outside and you're female, you can always apply uh, mineral-based makeup and that gives you that physical sunblock too. So you could just do a quick reapplication of um, foundation and powders, and that gives you an SPF um, of 15 or 30 in the mineral-based makeup. So it's a little tip or trick. Um, so we've talked about all the different places your skin could be. 
Um, and as we mentioned, it's always changing. So you're going to analyze it all the time. You're going to um, see how it feels all the time. Um, I want to go back to those of you that have really dehydrated and dry skin and do a gentle reminder that if you apply your body lotions and creams, your face lotions and creams to a moist skin, you're gonna have better penetration. So um, many, many years ago, toners got a bad rap because they were very, very astringent. They were there to strip oils from the skin. And there are still toners on the market that do that. Um, but nowadays, most spritz toners are adding extra um, hydrating type ingredients to the skin. So they're a great way to keep that skin damp prior to applying your moisturizer. Um, and we have a little bit of a tip trick coming in the newsletter that you'll be getting on how you can create your own uh, toner at home if you don't have one that you're using to keep that skin moist um, prior to applying your moisturizer. Um, another note too, if you have that really dry dehydrated skin is you're gonna cut down your shower and bath time and you're going to use tepid, not hot water, because water is actually going to pull some moisture away from your skin. So as much as it sounds delightful to have a long, hot, hot bath, it can actually dry and dehydrate your skin on the whole of your body, because we're talking everywhere, even the skin on your scalp is experiencing all of this. So these are things to consider um, when you're taking a bath or shower. Um, a quick mini treatment that you can do at home and something that uh, skincare therapists probably don't mention that you can do at home. You can layer your masks that you have at home too. So if you go through your cupboard tonight and you find, oh, I have this hydrating mask I haven't used in a while and oh, I have a dry skin mask. You can definitely alternate those products, do one for 20 minutes one day, one for 20 minutes the other day. But if you're really noticing those changes in the um, texture and trigger of your skin, then you can do your 20 minutes to 30 minutes with your hydrating mask. You'll be surprised. It's almost all absorbed in your skin. Just go ahead and apply on top of it your dry skin mask and let that sit for another 30 minutes. And it will really revitalize your skin and give you a nice little mini spa treatment at home. Um, I think one other thing that I would like to talk about, which is a little bit of a fringe topic, but we have a couple minutes, so I'm going to talk about it. Um, so chemotherapy attacks fast growing cells, cancer being a fast growing cell, and that's what we want it to attack. It also affects skin, hair, nails, and the gastrointestinal tract, the lining. So let's talk a bit on nails. Um, while you're in active treatment, your nails may become a little bit more sensitive. The growth period might be a little bit different, um, meaning slower. And there's sometimes a little bit more ridges and you can see little ring marks here. Um, each time you get chemotherapy, you'll have like a, a tree trunk ring. You can read your nails and see um, how many treatments you've had. Uh, what you can do to treat that sensitivity is, I, I really would say not go and get um, manicures unless you have a professional manicure you trust. I, I wouldn't say to go into a walk-in place. I wouldn't cut cuticles or anything like that. You can nourish your cuticles. You can push them back. Um, just staying away from doing really aggressive type things. But I wanna give you a resolution if you're having that kind of flakiness that happens on the top of your nails. Um, clear nail polish can do really great wonders at softening that so it doesn't attach to sweaters. Um, but I do wanna highlight some people are so sensitive that the weight of a nail polish also feels a little bit too occlusive. So it's just a little um, kind of added benefit. You could add that in there if you wanted to. Um, sometimes your team will say not to do acrylic nails or, um, gel nails, or I don't even know what those press on things are called, the little strips, um, anything that you can't see through and that can rip that top layer of nail off is a little bit too much when you're in active treatment or recent recovery. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit in about nails because to me, they're a little, they're in the skincare realm, even though they're keratinized. Um, that was a fast 20 minutes and I could talk about skin for hours, um, but we just don't have that kind of time tonight. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Dr. Khan, and, um, I look forward to the questions that you all might have.
Thank you so much, Carrie. That was very informative. Um, I definitely learned a lot. If anybody has any questions, please put them into the chat box and Carrie will answer all of your questions towards the end of the event. Also a quick reminder, Carrie mentioned that you'll be getting a newsletter. So if you registered for the event, um, there'll be a newsletter going out. There'll be small little excerpts from both of our speakers today and also a short survey. So please take the time to fill that out. We would love to hear feedback about what you are interested in and how you've enjoyed our talks tonight. Um, also, um, a quick reminder also to please put into your calendar. Our next event will be February 16th, uh, 2022. And we're really excited about next year, hopefully moving into a time when we can meet in person. For now, we have set a date for the virtual event. And without further ado, Anusha YJ Kumar is gonna to talk to us. Um, go ahead and start Anusha. So much, Dr. Khan and Carrie, thank you for that. I learned so much as well and uh, could have listened to you talk for much longer. It was truly fascinating. So thank you so much for that. And now we will segue into mindfulness as a tool for resilience. And this is something that we've all needed a lot more of over the past year and a half in particular. So I wanted to touch upon how we can utilize the practice of mindfulness as a way to calm our bodies and minds with our breast cancer diagnosis during treatment and post-treatment also, and just how we can begin live from a mindful stance and way of living. And it definitely is a daily lived practice. Next slide, please. So practicing mindfulness, I kind of wanted to break down what that means. And there's a lot of kind of misconceptions about mindfulness. So what is it? Well, hopefully you're doing it right now, giving your attention, that's 100% of your attention to the time that we have together today for this event. So it's basically bringing your mind into the present moment, which is right now. So what that really means is most of the time, we're not present. We're either thinking about the past or we're thinking or worrying about the future. And that can even be mundane things. So it could be something that happened earlier today that you're kind of replaying in your mind, or it could be something that you have scheduled tomorrow or next week. And so what research has shown is that most of us are actually not living with mindful presence. We're not actually present. And we see this play out in our daily lives with our interactions with our friends, our interactions at work with our colleagues, and the list goes on. So practicing mindfulness can be done anywhere at any time, simply by utilizing your breath, which is what we did at the beginning practice, and we'll have time to do a meditation at the end of today, and really just trying to be present. And it's difficult. Uh, another tip that really helps with mindfulness is to put your phone away. Uh, most of the time we have our phone with invisible sight, and so we end up picking it up. Or we end up, you know, looking at YouTube videos or scrolling through news feeds or looking at animal memes. And as cute as the animal memes have been over the past year, you know, there's only so many cats that we can look at. So I really invite you all as part of your practice of mindfulness to put the phone out of sight. Now, I'm not saying, you know, shove it away, lock it in a drawer and never see it again, because that just isn't possible in the world that we live in. But to have times where your phone isn't necessarily on your person or right by you. And interestingly, they've also big studies are also illustrating that if you're trying to concentrate on something, uh, just having your your phone in sight can be very distracting. So I myself, when I'm working on something that really needs my undivided attention, I put my phone out of sight. So how can we practice mindfulness? Very simply through our breath. You can do this anywhere at any time as we did at the beginning of today. And it really enables us to bring our body and mind together, which enables us, even if just for a millisecond, to be present with ourselves, with our physical bodies, and even with our thoughts, and to start drawing awareness to what is going on up here. 
And a lot of the time, you know, we're feeling this kind of sense of background anxiety that we can't place a finger on. And that's that constant kind of cascading thoughts that we all have. It said that the average person has about 60,000 thoughts a day. Now, some of you uh, are thinking, wow, is that all? And perhaps others of you are thinking, wow, I didn't realize that was so many. The issue with the cascading thoughts are a lot of those are repetitive and oftentimes a lot of those are negative. And so part of the practice of mindfulness as a way to develop resilience is to become aware of the thought forms that are arising in our minds without judgment, without resistance, so we can actually practice three central components of a mindfulness practice, which is self-love, self-compassion, and non-judgment. And I wanted to share, because I always love a quote, I wanted to share a quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, who is one of my favorite authors on mindfulness. He's a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. And he says, when you breathe in, you bring yourself together, body and mind, you become one. So when we take an inhale and we take an exhale, we are really enabled to bring the body and mind together as one through our breath. And that can sometimes be one of the most simplistic things that we can do in our day to help develop more resilience in these challenging times. Next slide, please. So the impact of stress, uh, we're probably all very familiar with feeling stressed and anxious, but I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the actual impact of stress on our body. So stress, as we all know, uh, specifically with breast cancer, actually increased levels of stress increase the spread of breast cancer specifically. Elevated, elevated levels of cortisol cause a number of different things, and I've listed them all here, which I'll just read through. Lower immune function, high blood pressure, cholesterol, heart disease, stroke, hypertension, weight gain, an increased risk for depression or mental illness, and a lower life expectancy. So when we think about one of the most simplistic ways to release this elevated level of cortisol in our bloodstream, what people may not be aware of is that we can actually do it through our breath. So when we take an inhale and we actually force an exhalation that I'll demonstrate and we'll get time to practice at the end, we're helping to alleviate those elevated levels of cortisol in our bloodstream. Now, another proven way to alleviate levels of cortisol is actually through regular physical exercise. Uh, but quite often that might not be accessible if you're going through treatment uh, and you're just not feeling up to it. And also if we're feeling stressed at 9 a.m. and we've got some kind of physical exercise planned at 6 p.m., that's actually not going to help us in that moment. So what I always guide my patients to do at Hogue is to focus on their breath, even taking three simplistic breaths that we'll go through shortly. That's an inhale and an audible exhale helps to activate the parasympathetic nervous system response in the body, which is the aspect of our central nervous system that moves us away from that consistent state of fight or flight to a rest and digest response. Next slide, please. So I also love an image. Uh, and this is the zebra who we uh, probably have all felt like over the past year and a half losing its stripes and thinking, wow, I must be stressed. And this is the thing about stress. Often we just live with it. You know, it impacts our sleep, it impacts our mental health, it impacts our physical health, but sometimes we just don't know what to do. and one of the things that I love so much about my work at Hogue specifically is introducing our pre-vivers, our survivors, and our thrivers, those in the metastatic breast cancer community, to simplistic breathwork practices that can help you now, today, in this moment. I'm not saying that it magically makes all of your problems disappear and it's you know rainbows and unicorns, but what it does do is just help you to cope with whatever is going on in your day, in your life, and in your mind, even beyond your cancer diagnosis and treatment. And what I always like to say to my patients is, 
it only takes five minutes. And this is some of the research that I am gifted to work on at Hoag, which is kind of proving the efficacy of simplistic meditation practices in our day. And nobody can tell me that you don't have five minutes because we've all got five minutes. And you know, you might not have 20 minutes even or 45 minutes or 60 minutes, but I think if we're really honest with ourselves, we can all admit that we have five minutes in our day to dedicate to a meditation practice. And the wonderful thing about this five minutes is you will feel better. And I'm often asked, and we'll have time for questions at the end, you know, what are the, the benefits of, of developing and committing to a daily meditation practice? And one in my own personal life, probably one of the uh, most fulfilling benefits has been that it helps us to be become less reactionary. Let's pause. It doesn't mean that we're not reacting. It just means that we're able to somewhat control some of our reactions to people, to situations, and to life in general. Next slide, please. So just to recap here, some of our solutions to stress that I'm covering from a mindfulness perspective are regular physical exercise, mindfulness and meditation practices. And when we take that inhale and force that exhale, it actually activates the vagus nerve, which is part of the autonomic nervous system. And it basically triggers that signal within the autonomic nervous system to activate that parasympathetic nervous system response that interfaces with our heart, our digestive tract and our lungs. So when we take those inhales and we force those long lengthening exhalations, we're able to slow the heart rate down, lower our blood pressure and help to decrease those elevated levels of cortisol in our bloodstream. Next slide, please. Now, the time has arrived for, you know, and, and perhaps for some of you, meditation is new. I always like to offer a practice wherever I am, even on clinic days, because very often what I've honestly found is that people are terrified of meditation and who can blame them with how meditation is post portrayed in mainstream yoga and wellness. So what I always like to do with our patients is lead them through a meditation practice so they themselves can feel how simplistic and effective and accessible these practices are in your daily life. So wherever you all are now, I want you to come to a comfortable seat. The legs are uncrossed here, soles of the feet are planting. And there really is only one general rule in a meditation hey, practice. Hey, 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 I'm sorry, I'm just being in. Uh, darling. I didn't leave my pants. Okay, good job, darling. Okay, hey, go and find daddy, no, okay? I'm not okay, so we're going to take our attention to our breath, the joys of, of parenting. And wherever you are, I want you to come to a comfortable seat. Gently closing the eye. Again, you don't have to close your eyes if that doesn't feel good to you. You're just coming to a place of stillness. And the only rule here is the spinal column must be in a neutral position. So the chin is parallel to the floor here. Spinal column is neutral. And we're going to begin here with taking three deep inhales and three deep exhales. So just exhale gently all the air out of the lungs and then begin the inhalation through the nose with a loud audible exhale through the mouth. So it's that forced exhalation that activates that parasympathetic nervous system response. And we're going to do that two more times. So a deep inhalation through the nose and an audible exhalation through the mouth. One more time, a deep inhalation through the nose and an audible exhalation through the mouth. 
And once you've completed your three rounds of that breathwork pattern, release, returning to your normal rhythm and pattern of breathing. As we just take a moment here to gently relax the shoulders down away from the ears, relaxing and releasing the muscles in the face, any tension in the neck, the jaw area, releasing the point between the eyebrows, releasing the tongue from the hard palate of the roof of the mouth. And just allowing the mind and body to come into that place of stillness and of quiet within letting go of your daily worries, your cares, your concerns. You have none of those things in this moment. All that you have is your breath. If thoughts are coming into the mind, that is completely fine and normal. But just allow any thoughts that may be arising to drift away like clouds in the sky as you return to your body and your breath, your body and your breath, your body and your breath. And now I want you to take your attention to the chest and belly area and just become aware of the movement there as you breathe. Just feel the movement. You're not trying to breathe in any particular way right now. You are simply breathing as it comes. There are no need for judgments or opinions here. If you have them, just allow them again to drift away like clouds in the sky as you return to your body and your breath, your body and your breath, your body and your breath. And you will soon be inhaling for my count and exhaling for my count. So exhale all of the air out of the lungs and then begin the inhalation through the nose for the count of one, two, three. Exhale through the nose with the mouth closed for five, four, three, two, one. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, five, four, three, two, one. Continue that breath work pattern for three more rounds at your own pace to your own breath. And if that cadence is too much, you can do an inhale of two and an exhale for four or an inhale of one and exhale for three. So just pick whatever cadence works best for you. And as you inhale, I want you to silently repeat to yourself, I am at peace. And as you exhale, I want you to silently repeat to yourself, all is well in my world. I am at peace on the inhale, all is well in my world on the exhale. I am at peace on the inhale. All is well in my world on the exhale. So really allow yourself to feel a sense of peace washing over you in this moment as you inhale and allow yourself to feel that all is well in your world regardless of your external situation or circumstance. You are at peace on the inhale. 
All is well in your world on the exhale. And once you've completed your rounds of that breathwork pattern, if it was three or more, release. There's no rush to arrive, just release whenever you get there, returning to your normal rhythm and pattern of breathing. As we take a moment of silence to absorb our practice, Now slowly start to bring your consciousness and your awareness back to the physical body. Gently feeling the weight of your legs on the chair or wherever you're situated. The weight of your arms on your legs. The weight of your head on your neck. As you slowly and gently blink the eyes open if they were closed returning to your physical surroundings. And that's one of my uh, favorite meditation practices that you can begin doing. You don't even have to remember everything that I've said. You can simply even just count the breath. So three on the inhale, five on the exhale. Just pick whatever cadence works for you. Just ensuring that you're lengthening, you're at least doubling if you can do lengthening that exhalation uh, and if you're having trouble sleeping that can also be a really lovely practice to do just before bed i hope you all enjoyed now i'll hand back over to dr khan as we get ready to open for questions great thank you so much um, you had some great tips to help us kind of deal with all the things that have been going on through the pandemic and all the changes everybody's been dealing with. So thank you again and a wonderful mindfulness and meditation practice that we can all um, be doing at home. So um, we had some great talks tonight. I hope you guys really enjoyed. We're excited for the question and answer. So if you haven't already, please uh, put any questions into the chat box. I have a few questions, so I'll get started. Um, and just a reminder to everybody at the end of the event, you will get a newsletter with a survey and we'd love to hear back from you. So um, my first question, um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and answer it. It's, the question is, if you get a COVID booster, how many days or weeks should you wait before you get a mammogram after the booster shot? So just to give a little bit of background, whenever anybody's gotten a vaccine, whether it's the COVID vaccine or the flu vaccine, you can get a pretty strong immune response, which we want. That is the whole goal of the vaccine. Um, with the it, strong immune response, you can get swelling of your lymph nodes, which just means that the vaccine really is working. So oftentimes when women are getting mammograms, the lymph nodes underneath the armpit are being looked at because that can be an indicator for breast cancer as well. So it can be a little bit confusing if you just recently got a vaccine and all of a sudden get a mammogram because then your lymph nodes are swollen for the reasons of the vaccine, not particularly because of breast cancer. So it is recommended that you wait at least six weeks after receiving your vaccine, whether that be the COVID vaccine booster or the flu shot before you uh, schedule your routine screening imaging. So this is not true for anybody that feels a lump or is being actively worked up for breast cancer, but specifically for screening mammograms, meaning you don't have any concerns, you're just coming in for your routine yearly mammograms, go ahead and plan to reschedule them. I've actually had lots of patients, even at six weeks, still have swollen lymph nodes. So don't be surprised if you need to come back, it's totally fine and normal. And your doctor will just order additional imaging. You might have to do a little bit of a short-term follow-up. So uh, that was the first question. Um, the next question is for Carrie. So Carrie, um, is there anything that we can do to prevent uh, loss of skin elasticity or something that will help build collagen in our skin? Ooh, um, well, okay. So that's a big question um, because we would wanna go back to where you are in treatment because what I would be recommending are ingredients that increase fibroblast activity. So they increase um, skin regeneration, specifically collagen and elastin. These types of ingredients penetrate deeper into the skin. So um, we don't wanna be using those if our skin is at all sensitive. 
Um, but it's tricky because also during, um, during treatment and also in recovery, um, and specifically with breast cancer, you might have menopausal skin and menopausal skin is lacking a lot of skin elasticity and tone. Um, I would say if you are not in active treatment or recent recovery, if you are in long-term survivorship or managing metastatic disease, partner with your skincare therapist, do a series of treatments. If you're not a sensitive skin, you might look into doing some of those stronger based um, treatments. So whether it's um, microneedling, lasering uh, or laser services, IPL photofacials are very, very helpful. There are some great injectables out there that can complement some of the other treatments that you're doing. Of course, this is all beyond what I as a licensed esthetician am allowed to recommend, but you can start partnering with your physicians and estheticians to figure out what your next steps are gonna be. Great, thank you so much, Carrie. So the next question is for Anusha. Um, the, the commenter says that it's so much easier to meditate when somebody else is guiding me through. Are there any resources that I can use to help with guided meditation? Yes, that's a great question. And to be honest with you, guided meditations work. They take the effort and the ease out of it. The clinical research that I'm conducting at Hogue Hospital is actually focused on guided meditations for our patients. And so I highly recommend some of the apps that are out there, be it the Calm app, the Insight Timer, Headspace. Uh, I can also, as part of the newsletter provide which I think I'm doing anyway, a free meditation that's available via my website, uh, which is very similar to the meditation that I guided you all through. But ultimately, I highly recommend that you all use guided meditations because it does help us to focus the mind and get into a kind of faster state of calmness, especially if we are pressed for time. And the other thing about guided meditations are we're not wondering how long as like, much time has gone. We're not checking out what you think we've been sitting here for two minutes or five minutes. We can pick a length of a guided meditation that works for us and know that when it ends, that five minutes or that seven minutes is up. So I highly recommend guided meditations. And those are some resources that you can all do. I think with some of those apps, you have to pay for them, but I uh, think there might be some some complementary options. The only caveat I have with that is I had to do research for my book that Dr. Sadia Khan kindly wrote the forward for, and I myself went on the Calm app and felt quite stressed after 15 minutes because there was thousands and thousands of meditations and it was difficult to find. I think I tried three and I hadn't even completed one in 15 minutes. So what I would say is if you are using an app, don't feel that you have to go through the 10,000 meditations on there, really, right? We are creatures of habit. We like routine, especially in this time of flux over the past year and a half. So what I would recommend is if you are using an app or any guided meditation, choose between one to three that you like and just continue to do those. You'll actually end up finding that quite soothing. Great, thanks Anusha for giving us those resources. Um, so Carrie, to help strengthening our nails, does eating jello or gelatin products help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've heard that they do. Um, I know that some people, uh, first of all, always check with your physician whether or not you can ingest something. I've heard that those help and also prenatal medication can help, but I am not falling under the nutritionist category. Um, so I'm not making those recommendations just to make sure it's <laughs> clear. I, I definitely think that I've, um, you know, biotin is recommended for hair, skin, um, health. Um, it helps also for women who are postpartum when they've had hair loss after um, pregnancy. So that usually is pretty safe. But as Carrie mentioned, if you're on any ongoing chemo or any specific medications with your doctor, always double check that there isn't any interaction and any reason why you couldn't take it. But biotin is pretty easy over the counter um, vitamin that does help with hair and skin health. Um, okay, so our next question is for you, Anusha. Um, so can you tell us, um, somebody's trying to get um, their meditation practice going. Is there a particular time that's easiest or best uh, to start doing the meditation? And what would you recommend? So I will answer that with two answers. What I recommend is first thing in the morning, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And my second recommendation is whatever time works for you is the best time. 
So for many of us, it might be difficult to get a, a morning practice in. Uh, and so what I would say is wherever you're able to carve out some space in your day, do that. However, if you are able to practice first thing in the morning, ideally within the th first 30 minutes of you rising before you've had any caffeine or, you know, any kinds of drinks that might be stimulating you tea or coffee, you want to be getting that practice in. And I, uh, I mean, we all met my son who just interrupted us. <laughs> So I can say that uh, first thing in the morning was very difficult for me during the first year of my son uh, being born. And so I just did it whenever I could, to be perfectly honest with you. And sometimes that was right at the end of my day. I uh, now, uh, though, wake up early because I know I need to get my practice in first thing in the morning. And the reason that I do that is because I am fully aware of the difference in myself if I've meditated first thing in the morning and if I haven't, I find that even though I have a long term practice, I'm still more reactionary if I haven't had time to get in my practice. So I get up in the morning because I know I need to. And the wonderful thing about practicing meditation daily is it just becomes like brushing your teeth, taking a shower, eating, etc. It becomes a part of your day and your life. And you do it because you'll start to see the visible differences and how you just feel internally after practicing. And like I said, it doesn't have to be 60 minutes. It can be five minutes, which is tangible and accessible. And I just invite you all begin. We've just done a practice today. Begin five minutes for the next seven days and see how you feel next Tuesday. And I'm not, again, this isn't going to magically, I mean, maybe you will, you know, have transformed. Uh, but it, it is those subtle differences that we start to see with regular daily practice. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, Carrie, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, so um, if your skin feels, the, the commenter says, um, my skin feels tight and uncomfortable all over my body, including my scalp. Is there something that you can recommend for this feeling of tightness? So I would think about first what you have at home and what you're using. So um, make sure to apply your body lotion all over your entire body, including your scalp. Um, some people will use their facial moisturizer on their scalp. It depends on the cost of that moisturizer and what they're willing to spend. But if that is happening and you're still uncomfortable and tight, then you're going to need to move from a lotion to something that's heavier, a cream. Um, so go to a thicker weight product and apply that all over your body, face and scalp. Um, and that should help create that artificial acid mantle. Cause it sounds to me like it's getting degraded. And it sounds to me, if you don't start doing that, you're going to get more hot spots in different areas. So increase the weight of your moisturizers. Great. Um, the second question is, um, the patient has noticed that their brows are thinning, um, and how they're asking how they can manage this or improve this. Um, and they're asking if it's okay to use lash uh, growth serum while on chemotherapy. Okay. Um, there's a few layers to this. So the brow and lash serums, um, all of them, whether they're prescription or if they're over the counter, they all have the same active ingredient. They're just at varying degrees. Um, so they're all great. Um, the one thing to consider is you probably want to position it post chemotherapy because the chemotherapy is attacking those cells as they're developing. So even though you get a, may get a little bit of a respite in between chemotherapies and a little bit of regrowth, it's not going to be noticeable. So let's say someone has gifted you a year's worth of these products. Um, I've, I've heard people say this, I used them the whole entire time and I, my brows maintained, I think. Yeah, if you want to try it, great, but I think it might be better positioned at the end of treatment. Um, the other things to consider is not all chemotherapies cause brow and lashes to fall out, um, and some of it cause just thinning. Um, thinning is noticeable, so I don't want to put the qualifier of just thinning. Um, the other things that you can do is you can draw it in. There are amazing bra product, brow products, bra, brow products out there that are um, 
extended wear. So you can apply them to the skin. You can even wash your face at night and they'll still be present. You can sleep in them and wake up with a full brow um, because they're extended wear, long wear. You can get as inexpensive as drugstore varieties all the way up to um, very, very expensive brands at Sephora and Ulta. Um, one thing also, you can, well, two other things. You can also consider doing microblading, which is a permanent makeup technique. We've had a permanent makeup artist in one of these events before, so she would be a great person to refer to. But the microblading is amazing because they're hair-like strokes versus the kind of all over one color. So it's really very natural and realistic, but keep in mind microblading or tattooing is breaking the skin. So we don't want to compromise the immune system. You're definitely going to want to talk to your oncologist and see if you're in a state where you can have that done state of treatment, not state state. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of things that can be done with product, with, um, serums that grow the hair and lashes. And then also with, um, long-term services like microblading. Great, thank you so much, Gary. Very informative. So Anusha, um, can you give us some easy ways that we can practice mindfulness and meditation? I know you gave some great examples and you talked about the apps, but just give us some easy steps on how we can kind of use that in our everyday practice. So I think let's get some mindfulness tips going. And I gave a few, I mean, I'll just repeat one of them, which is really to put our phone away especially if we're spending time with friends and family. So we can actually give our undivided attention to the people that we're with. I mean, so often uh, that isn't the case. You know, we're supposed to be enjoying this time with loved ones and everybody's on their phones. And so what I would, as the holidays are approaching, I would invite you all to think about being mindfully present with your loved ones, perhaps, you know, limiting time on technology and getting outside. So, you know, for those of us, I think many of us are living in Southern California, aside from today, there really is no excuse. Oh, sorry, was it yesterday where it rained all day? There really is no excuse not to be getting outside. And that's a wonderful way to practice mindfulness by getting off your phone, getting off technology, and really going on what I call a mindful walk, where you're actually noticing your surroundings. And the University of Exeter did uh, a research piece a few years ago, actually, that illustrated that just being in nature was as effective as exercising in nature, which they hadn't actually done any research on that. So if you're currently undergoing treatment, uh, be it chemotherapy or radiation, and you're feeling exhausted, perhaps you can just sit outside in your back area if you have one, or find a local park that you can drive through and sit under some shade, and just get outside. Being in nature, now research is proving, Western medicine is illustrating that it helps us alleviate stress and tension in the physical body and the mind. And uh, I find, found that piece of research really interesting because especially for those of us living here, nature is so accessible. And so just get outside as often as you can without technology and just notice. And that's a very simplistic way of practicing mindfulness. You can also practice mindfulness when you're driving, something that again, we all need to be doing in Southern California. Uh, I know that, you know, for those of us that, that drive here, there's accidents all the time. And so what I would invite you to do when you're driving is to be present when you're driving. And let's be honest, sometimes we get from A to B, we don't know how we've got there. And that clearly illustrates that we're just in that A to B robot mode. We're not actually being present and mindful of our surroundings. So you can practice mindfulness when you're driving. You can practice mindfulness when you're cooking. And to really notice, you know, the vegetables that you're chopping, how you're cooking, what you're cooking. And so really think about mindfulness specifically as just a way of living and something that you can practice wherever you are in any moment of your day or life. And then the meditation practice is a little bit different because ideally you're coming to a place of stillness and silence to spend that five minute practice going within uh, to quiet the mind. Yeah, though, I think those are two wonderful, you know, delineations of the difference between mindfulness and meditation. And I think not having your phone tied to your body all the time is such a good way to start kind of working on mindfulness because, you, you know, as soon as your phone is there, inevitably you're getting 
messages and emails and you you're like tempted to go on to Instagram. So I think those are great tips, I think, for everyone um, to continue and practice every day. Um, we're going to close with one last question. Um, Carrie, I'm going to give this one to you. It seems like a very good question. Um, so the patient mentioned that since they started chemotherapy, they noticed brown spots on their face um, that are darker. Is there anything that you would suggest that they can use to lighten those spots? Well, first you have to determine, is this newer dark spots. So some people have had hyperpigmentation that they've dealt with in the past that is showing up due to treatment. And if you're in active treatment, while you're going through that treatment, there's not much you can do except for sunscreen to help minimize what those brown spots are going to be looking like. Um, if you are moving into recovery and also more survivorship mode, so your skin isn't as sensitive, you can start really using the ingredients that help to minimize that pigmentation. So you can start using your antioxidants, vitamin A, vitamin C. You can start using skin lightening ingredients, whether it's a prescription variety or, um, or if it's over the counter, I'd also recommend doing a series of treatments with your esthetician. So doing your stronger grade peels um, can really help minimize that pigmentation. Of course, with all of those, you're gonna be using sunscreen as well. Anyone that's been managing pigmentation knows that it's a full on effort of sunscreen all the time and active ingredients, you have to do them both. Great. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this wonderful event and our two great speakers. Just remember it was um, recorded, so it will be living on the Hogue um, YouTube, uh, face, um, or YouTube page. So please look out for this event and any of our previous events. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Just a reminder, again, you'll get a newsletter if you registered for the event. And please remind your loved ones to get a mammogram if they haven't already had one um, in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So thank you all and have a wonderful night.